In our last lecture, we started talking about sequential Boolean circuits. Circuits for which the output depended not only on the current state of its inputs, but also the sequence in which the inputs were given. In other words, circuits which depend on history of the inputs. Now, the most basic such sequential circuit happens to be the RS latch, which we met in the last lecture. R and S stand for reset and set, respectively. And uh, right now on your screen, you can see an implementation of the RS latch using NAND gates only. The outputs Q and Q bar are fed back to the inputs of the other NAND gates. And it's the result of this feedback that the NAND latch has a memory effect. We had already described this in the last lecture. Let me just remind you of what the basics here is, if you make R low and S1, then the circuit is going to go into a state in which Q is 1, Q bar is 0. On the other hand, if you keep R1 and make S0, the circuit is going to reset and Q is going to go to 0 and Q bar is going to go to 1. The important point is, after doing either of these, if you went to the standard operating state of this particular circuit, which happens with both inputs set at 1, then the output will not change from what its value was before. If you had set the latch by making r equal to 0, s equal to 1, then after you get r back to its normal value of 1, keeping s1 of course, Q will stay at 1, Q bar will stay at 0. On the other hand, if you reset the latch first and then go back to the 1, 1 input state, Q is going to be 0, Q bar is going to be 1. For the inputs 1 and 1 for R and S, both the 1, 0 and the 0, 1 output states are stable, as you can easily figure out just by seeing what the NAND gates do. So this is a bistable circuit. And which one of the two states you will go into, that depends on what you did previously. And finally, let me remind you that for the NAND latch, both inputs being zero is a big no-no, and that is called the race condition. Not because when you make R and S both zero, you do not know what Q and Q bar are. Indeed, Q and Q bar both become one. But if after doing this, you went back to the normal state of R and S both being 1, then this output state Q equal to Q bar equal to 1 is not stable. And the circuit goes either into the 1, 0 situation or the 0, 1 state. Which one will occur depends primarily on chance factors like which of the two NAND gates is faster and so on. And as a result, this is something which we cannot determine beforehand. And this is something we would want to avoid. Now, in the last lecture, we discussed all of this. And we also took a look at how you can modify the NAND latch by introducing a clock, then by modifying it to build a D latch, a D flip flop. And then from there went on to use the D flip flop in building practical useful circuits like the registers and the shift registers. In today's lecture, we are going to take a look at another very important kind of flip-flop, again a modification of the basic RS flip-flop. And one very important use of this new kind, the so-called JK flip-flop, happens to be in building counters. Counters are another basic building block of the modern digital computer. But before we get to counters, we have to understand the JK flip-flop first. The basic circuit of the JK flip-flop is on your screens right now. Now this is an edge-triggered JK flip-flop, which is controlled by a clock. But let me just remind you that this CR combination with a very, very small time constant ensures that, that when a clock pulse comes in, what actually goes to a circuit is a very sharp spike on the positive clock edge. And that is the only time when you really have a high clock for the circuit. At all the other times, 
the clock essentially is low. Now just for contrast, let me remind you of a circuit which we met in the last lecture. In fact, it was the very next circuit after we talked about the RS latch and that is the clocked RS latch. And if you take a look at this circuit and the JK flip-flop one, you would realize that they are very similar except that in addition to the feedback that you have in the RS latch of Q going back to the input of the other NAND gate and Q bar going back to the input of the Q NAND gate, so to speak, you have another layer of feedback. Q bar goes all the way back to this initial NAND gate, which now is a three input NAND gate. And Q goes back to the NAND gate, which has been labeled two in our circuit. So you start with the clock RS slash, put an additional layer of feedback and you end up with the JK flip-flop. Now we will try to understand exactly what the JK flip-flop does. That thing has been summarized in the table to the right here, but we will come back to the table later. Let us just take a look at the basic action of this. And for this, all I need to do is remind you that for a NAND gate, if any input is low, the output is supposed to be high. And if one input is high, the output essentially is a complement of the other input if it's a two input NAND gate. Now, here, let us start with different input combinations. Note that here the input uh, signals are not called R and S, they are called J and K. That's because they are no longer used only to set and reset the latch. There are other possible combinations which act differently here. And J and K are the standard labels which we use for these inputs. And that is why this is called a JK flip-flop. Not very imaginative if you ask me. But anyway, let us start with the possibility that J and K are both zero. Now, if J and K are both zero, this is called the inactive state. And obviously, if J and K are both zero, then both these two NAND gates which have been labeled one and two have one input which is low and therefore have a high output. So R and S, which are actually the RS signals toward this NAND latch, they both go to one. And this, remember, is the memory state for a NAND latch. So when J and K are zero, Q and Q bar simply will not change. Now, if you look at the clock, on the other hand, remember the clock comes in as a series sequence of square pulses, but because of this pulse shaping that happens due to the CR circuit, the only time you get a high pulse is for a very narrow time interval at each rising clock edge. Apart from that, for all other cases, when the clock is high at a high level or low or in a trailing edge or a falling edge, the clock is effectively low for the circuit. So, for all such cases, apart from the rising clock edge, one input to one and two is again low and you are going to go to get RNS high and as a result Q and Q bar will simply not change. So clock being level at zero, level at one or falling, everything other than the rising edge, you have no change in the output. Irrespective of the clock, if J and K are both zero, then you have no change in the output. Now, let's consider other possibilities for J and K. If J is zero and K is one, then you can see immediately that because J is zero, this NAND gate, the one labeled one, has a high output, so R is one. S right now depends on the other inputs to the gate number two. So just because J is zero, K is one, we cannot be sure about S. Now there are two possible cases. If it so happens that before this, Q was 0 and Q bar was 1, that is, the latch was in a reset situation, 
then q equal to 0 being fed back to this NAND gate immediately makes s equal to 1. So both r and s are now 1. r was 1 because first NAND gate, the one labeled 1, had a 1 output already because j was 0 and s is 1 because q is 0. So you have no change condition and that stays no change even in the next clock edge. If R and S are both 1, then of course the clock edge will not change anything. So, if the latch is already reset before J equals 0, K equals 1 is applied, it will stay reset. On the other hand, if you had Q equal to 1, Q bar equal to 0, a set latch. Then, on the next clock edge, what happens is, if you focus on this NAND gate 2, K is already 1, Q is 1 because of the output state, and on the next positive clock edge, the clock also becomes 1. So, all three inputs to 2 become 1, S goes to 0, and that immediately drives Q bar to 1, and this Q bar equal to 1 fed back to NAND latch number 3, which now has both inputs equal to 1, will make Q equal to 0. So, if J is equal to 0, K equal to 1, and the latch was reset to begin with, it will stay reset. If it was set to begin with, then on the next clock edge, it is going to go to reset. So either way, at the next clock edge, the latch is be going to be in the reset state, q bar equal to 1, q equal to 0. Now it should be pretty easy for you to figure out that if j equal to 0, k equal to 1 is changed to j equal to 1, k equal to 0, and the latch was already set, it will stay set, and if it was reset to begin with, on the next clock edge, it will set. That is, Q will go to 1, Q bar equal to 0. So, that is being summarized in the table so far. Just let me point out, when the clock is not on the rising edge, doesn't matter what J and K are, you are going to get no change. Irrespective of what the clock is, rising edge, falling edge, 0, 1, doesn't matter. If J and K are 0, you are going to get no change. On the rising edge of the clock, with J and K 0, 1, the latch is going to reset, Q is going to be 0. And again on the rising edge, with J and K 1, 0, the latch is going to set, so Q will be 1. Let us now consider the final and perhaps the most important input combination, J and K both equal to 1. Now, what will happen to the output actually will depend on what the output was just before the clock edge hits. So let's just say, before the clock edge, rising clock edge hits, Q and Q bar were 1 and 0. So this one gets fed back. So that two inputs of the NAND gate mark 2 is 1 and this 0 gets fed back so that you have 1 and 0 here. Of course, the moment you have one input zero, it doesn't really matter what clock is, R is going to go to one. However, notice that there is no real change right now. What happens is when the next clock edge hits, now you have three ones here and one one zero here. Of course, the single zero is enough to make R one, the three ones here makes S zero. And that immediately puts the RS latch composed of these two NAND gates in the, set in the reset condition. As R is 1, S is 0. So what is going to happen is that the output is going to change to Q equal to 0, Q bar equal to 1. So if you started with 1, 0 before the clock hit, once the clock edge hits, 
the output is going to change to 0 and 1. You can easily figure out yourself that if you had started with q equal to 0 q bar equal to 1 before the clock edge hits and then the moment the positive clock edge hits the output would change to 1 and 0. In other words with j and k both equal to 1 you have what is called a toggle scenario. The output just switches from whatever it was. And this toggling behavior of the JK flip-flop happens to be one of its most important properties and it is the one which is actually responsible for most of its applications like in co building counters. Now before we go on to talk about the next level which is the master-slave JK flip-flop, let me point out one thing. We have edge triggered this particular JK flip-flop by using a CR combination to shape the pulse. But using a CR combination is expensive, especially on a on an integrated circuit. So why couldn't we avoid it? Why couldn't we just level clock the JK flip-flop? Notice that apart from the other problems of lack of coordination if you are level clocking, which we described in the previous lecture, there is one much more serious issue with the JK flip-flop if we do level clocking. Remember, when J and K are both 1, the output toggles. The output toggles as long as the clock is high. Now, if we have level clocking, then the clock is high for substantial amount of time. And then what happens is, the output, which was perhaps 1, 0 before the clock went high, would toggle to 0, 1. This, of course, will take a slight amount of time. After all, each signal has to travel through two NAND gates and each gate has some propagation delay of a few nanoseconds. So maybe after 10 or 20 nanoseconds, the output will toggle. But then, if the clock is still high, which it will be unless the clock uh, duty cycle is, clock time period is very, very small. What you are going to get is a toggle again. And again, and again. So, if you actually were to level clock the JK flip-flop, then the toggling behavior would actually become rather erratic or in a certain way chaotic because you are going to get several toggles and what state you are going to end up with when the clock goes back low cannot be predicted with certainty. In any case, this multiple toggles is really not a great idea. That is why you need to edge trigger the circuit. In fact, you have to ensure that the rising edge of the clock provides this sharp decaying pulse at the output of the CR circuit. In, a, in fact, you have to ensure that the width of the sharp edge that you get when you try to shape the pulse through the CR circuit is so narrow that by the time the propagation delay is over, the rising edge has actually gone away. So you have to really aim at a small CR value. Now this multiple toggle which would have happened if you have a clock, if you have level clocking is actually co called the race condition in the JK flip-flop. This is different from the race condition that we met earlier for the RS flip-flop. This race is not really so much of a race as to which of the NAND gates is faster. This really is a case of multiple toggles that is of the signal getting back too soon. In fact, the race would also occur if your CR value does not, if, in fact, apart, if, in fact, a race can even occur for edge triggering if the time constant of your CR circuit is not small enough. 
the JK Master Slave flip flop or JK MS for short, which we are going to discuss next, is one way of preventing this particular kind of race condition at the expense of a slightly more complicated circuit. Before we go there, let me point out that the JK flip flop is an important enough circuit to have its own circuit symbol. This is the circuit symbol for a JK flip flop, very similar to the one which we saw for a D flip flop in the last lecture. A square box with the inputs J and K indicated on one side, Q and Q bar the outputs indicated on the other, and the two special overriding signals preset and clear indicated here. We have not shown the preset and clear in the circuit that we have shown so far, but you can easily incorporate them along the same lines as in which we included the preset and clear in the D flip flop in the last lecture. And the bubbles on these indicate that these are active low, that is preset and clear are supposed to be high most of the time. When you send them to low, they act. Of course, as is clear from the name, if you make preset low, it's going to actually set the latch to Q equal to 1, Q bar equal to 0. And clear, if you have to activate that, it's going to reset the latch. And preset and clear takes priority over all other inputs, J, K or the clock. Now the clock here is indicated by this entry. I should write down that this is the clock. The triangular wedge here, let me remind you, indicates that this thing is edge triggered. The one new thing which I put in here is this bubble on this, which indicates that this particular JK flip flop, unlike the one we saw a while ago, actually is negatively triggered. That means this one is going to actually act on negative or falling edges of the input clock, not on the rising edges as our JK flip flop was doing. Now, one way of getting a better understanding of the action of a JK flip-flop is this timing diagram that we have drawn here, which shows a clock signal which goes high and low, high and low with time. Of course, in all timing diagrams, time flows to the right. And we have shown some signal states. J was low until this, then went high and so on. Now let's try to understand what will happen to Q, the output, under this situation. Notice that as long as J and K are both low, Q does not change at all. Let's just assume Q started low, it will stay low until then. Here J has gone high, K is still low. So this is a set condition. However, note that the clock is not there right now. Remember, the clock is going to only respond at falling edges because we are talking about negative edge triggered JK flip flop. So, when the next falling edge arrives, which is here, the circuit is going to actually respond. And what's going to happen is because J is 1, K is 0, the circuit is going to set. So, Q will go to 1. Now, note that at this stage, J has returned to 0, so J and K are both 0 now. In any case, up to this point, JK flip-flop was inactive. So whatever Q was, it was maintained. Here J and K are both 0, that's also the memory state or no change state, inactive state. Q is maintained. Now K has gone to 1, so now you have J equal to 0, K equal to 1, which is a reset condition. But again, because the clock is inactive, remember, the JK flip-flop responds on a negative edge or a falling edge. This one is still not changing the output. At this, the next falling edge that the circuit encounters, the JK flip-flop goes to the reset condition. So Q goes to 0. Now let's follow this further. Here J and K are both 0, again no change. Now both of them go to 1. So this is being set up for toggling. But remember the toggle will happen only in the next clock edge, falling clock edge here. 
the queue toggles from 0 to 1. JNK stays on as 1. That's the input signal that we have given. And again, in the next falling clock edge, which is here, the circuit toggles and Q goes back to 0. So this sort of summarizes the kind of behavior our circuit can have. Let us now move on to the next circuit or next level of sophistication in the JK flip-flop, the JK master-slave flip-flop. And this is the circuit diagram for the JK master-slave flip-flop. As you can see from the circuit diagram, the JKMS flip-flop actually consists of two flip-flops. Both of them are clocked. The one on the left, which I have shown enclosed by this purple box, is called the master of the two. And the one enclosed in this orange box, these are of course fictitious boxes which I have just drawn to highlight the division. This one is called the slave. Note that while the master is correctly clocked, the slave is actually negatively clocked. Of course, that means that when the master is active, the slave is inactive and vice versa. Let us now try to understand how this particular circuit works. To begin the analysis, let us assume that Q is 0 and Q bar is 1. You can of course repeat the analysis for Q equal to 1, Q bar equal to 0 and figure out what will happen in that case yourselves. And just for ease of understanding, let us label these two outputs of the master flip-flop, which are of course inputs to the slave flip-flop as S and R, because these are definitely the set and reset and inputs for the clocked RS latch that you have as a slave here. Now, we are also going to consider a particular input combination. Let's begin with j equals 1, k equals 0. And once the clock goes high, what you have is 1 for the clock, 1 from j here, 0 from k, 1 from the clock here. Now this Q is fed back to 0 here and Q bar goes here as 1. Now, we didn't even have to bother about the value of Q. The, because you have K equals 0, this will automatically make this 1 and the three 1s here will make this 0. This 0 will force S to be 1. And now this 1 coming back here will give you 2 one input to the NAND, which will make R0. Of course, this 0 going back here will not really affect the fact that S is 1 because 1, 0 is enough to make S1. Anyway, this is the set input, the input which will set this slave RS latch, but it will not do that yet. Why not? Simply because of this NOT gate here, the clock is low for the slave flip-flop, at least at this point. Once the clock goes low, the master becomes inactive, but now the slave becomes active. And the S being 1, R being 0 for this RS latch here, simply changes the Q and Q bar to 1 and 0. Of course, this change in the value of Q and Q bar will be reflected in the inputs to these NAND gates of the master flip-flop. However, the clock now is low, so the master flip-flop will not be affected. So, once the clock edge goes low, you are going to end up with Q equals 1, Q bar equals 0. You can start with the situation with that Q was 1, Q bar was 0 to begin with and repeat the analysis. You will find that as long as you keep j equal to 1, k equal to 0, q will stay 1, q bar will stay 0 once the mean clock goes low. Just like j equal to 1, k equal to 0 was a set condition, j equal to 0, k equal to 1 will actually reset this particular jk master slave flip-flop. 
We will not discuss this in detail now because basically it's the same kind of argument that we gave a while ago. But I will just point out one thing. If you already had a latch which were reset, a uh, flip-flop which was reset, that is Q where 0 Q bar was 1, then this Q0 flowing in here would force this to be 1 and this 0 is alone enough to make the output of this NAND get 1 and the two 1s here essentially force this RS latch to go into the no change state. That of course means that the S and R will not change from what it was, clock or no clock, and as a result Q and Q bar will of course stay at 0 and 1. You should repeat the analysis for Q equal to 1, Q bar equal to 0 and convince yourselves that for such a case, once again when the clock goes high the master will change its state, but that will not affect the slave then but it will affect the slave once the clock goes low and it will actually reset 1, 0 and send it back to 0, 1. So this implies that once you have the falling clock edge, once the clock goes low that is, Q becomes 0 and Q bar becomes 1. It should be rather obvious from what we had said just a while ago that for j equal to 0 and k equal to 0, the flip-flop will be in the inactive state, that is, its output simply will not change irrespective of the clock. The most interesting case is when j is equal to k and they are both 1, then what happens is that once the clock goes high, the master toggles, can easily figure that out, and then, when the clock goes low, the slave toggles in response. So the overall effect is Q and Q bar toggles, 1, 0 becomes 0, 1, and 0, 1 becomes 1, 0, when J and K are 1, but that happens only when the clock edge goes low. Note that the possibility of a race is avoided here. This multiple toggles in one clock cycle cannot simply happen because when the clock goes high, the master toggles. At that point, the slave is inactive. So the slave's output will not change. But then, when the clock goes low, the slave's output toggles. That of course changes the inputs to the master, but now since the clock is low, the master will not be affected. Because the master and the slave are active in different halves of the clock cycle, we can prevent the kind of racing that is possible for a level-triggered JK flip-flop. One big advantage of using a JK MS as opposed to JK is that you can have level triggering and yet not have the condition for race. Avoiding the race condition, multiple toggles is very, very important. Edge triggering is actually quite complicated. You could do it simply by using a CR circuit with a very small time constant, but as I've already said, such a CR circuit in an integrated circuit will actually require a huge amount of space and hence cost a lot of money. The JKMS may look like a more complicated circuit, but it actually is way, way simpler and cheaper to implement on an integrated chip. And that is why the JKMS is perhaps the most used JK flip-flop. What about the circuit symbol for the JKMS? Well, let us go back a bit and take a look at the circuit symbol that we had for the JK flip-flop. Basically, the JKMS circuit diagram will look essentially the same, except for one thing. You will not have the edge triggering symbol there because you don't need to edge trigger. And usually, this is all that you use to indicate a JKMS flip-flop. The timing diagram for the JKMS flip-flop would also look very similar to what we have here. Remember, we had drawn these timing diagrams for a edge-triggered JK flip-flop, which actually re responded on the negative edge. Now, the bubble on the JKMS flip-flop 
also reminds us that the actual output, which is the output of the slave flip-flop, will only change on the negative level. And as a result, the timing diagram will essentially look the same as in this case. Let us now turn to one of the most important applications of JK flip-flops, that is in building counters. The kind of counter that is being shown on your screen right now is called a ripple counter. This is a 4-bit ripple counter which is made out of 4 JKMS flip-flops. You could also create the same using 4 negative edge-triggered JK flip-flops. By the way, there is nothing special about the number 4. We could add more JK flip-flops after this and make bigger and bigger counters, which would be able to count up to larger and larger numbers. Now, in order to think of this as a counter, you have to essentially read the outputs Q3, Q2, Q1, Q0, which are, of course, individually either 0 or 1, as depicting a binary number. For example, when Q3 is 1, Q2 is 0, Q1 is 1, and Q Q0 is 1. This actually stands for the number given by 11. Of course, 1011 is 11 in decimal. What this circuit does is that it keeps count of how many clock pulses are arriving and this output Q3, Q2, Q1, Q0 will keep on increasing every time a clock pulse arrives. Let us now try to understand how this works. Firstly, there is an input down here written CLR bar, which stands for the clear input. The bar on top simply shows that clear has to go low in order to really be active. And the fact that clear is active low is indicated by the bubbles that we have shown. Each of these JK flip-flops also have uh, the preset input and also the Q bar output, which we have not indicated simply because they are not of any interest for us right now for this application. Also note that the way this circuit has been constructed is that each and every one of these JK flip-flops have the J and K tied together. And all of them join to a single input which is being held at a high value. So J and K are both high for each and every one of these uh, JK flip-flops and so they are put in the toggle state. Now note that the output for the 0th JK flip-flop, the one on the right or the one standing for the least significant bit of our number Q3, Q2, Q1, Q0 is fed to the clock of the next JK flip-flop. The output to that one, Q1, is fed to the clock of the next JK flip-flop and so on. So basically, the output of each preceding JK flip-flop is driving the clock of the next. Let us now try to understand how this ripple counter will work. We will start by driving the clear input to low, that is clear bar to high, Setting all the four bits here, four output bits, Q3, Q2, Q1, and Q0 to 0. And now let us analyze what will happen as the clock signals come in. We have shown this in a timing diagram here. Remember, because J and K are both 1, the JKMS toggles, but only toggles at the falling clock edge or when the clock goes low. Okay, so this is how the thing is going to evolve now. At one falling edge, we have set all the cues to zero. After that, one complete clock cycle is finished and another falling edge arrives. Q0 will toggle because Q0, the Rightmost JK flip-flop has its clock signal taken directly from the input clock. So now you are going to get a toggle in Q0 and Q0 is going to shift to 1. 
Note that that means that this clock, this Q0, which is the clock for the next flip-flop, actually has gone up now. Since all of these JK flip-flops actually toggle on the negative edge of their respective clock, there is no change in Q1, no change in Q2 and Q3 as well. So now, the number, if you read this as Q3, Q2, Q1, Q0, which was 0, 0, 0, 0 to begin with, no clock pulses yet, is now reading 0, 0, 0, 1. Exactly one clock pulse has come in. Now, when one more clock pulse goes through, that is, when you get another falling edge, Q0 is now going to toggle back, back to 0. But now notice that this Q0 being the clock of the next JK flip-flop, as far as the next JK flip-flop is concerned, its clock has completed one complete cycle and has given a negative edge. Which means Q1, which was primed to toggle so far because G and K were both one for it, will actually now go high. Will toggle, will go high. So you will read 0, 0, 1, 0 as Q3, Q2, Q1, Q0. And that, of course, is the number 2, which, of course, matches with the fact that you now have two complete clock pulses. On the next complete clock pulse, that is on the next negative edge, Q0 is going to toggle back again. So it's going to rise to 1. Of course, uh, the Q0, which is providing the clock to the next one, has just completed only half a cycle, and this is anyway the rising edge. So, nothing will happen to this particular flip-flop. It will stay at 1, and you will get 0, 0, 1, 1. Next time a falling edge appears in the original clock, Q0 is going to toggle back to 0, but that will give you a falling edge to the clock for this particular JK flip-flop, and that is going to toggle and go to 0. Of course, once this goes to zero, Q1, which is actually providing the clock to this particular JK flip-flop, that has given a falling edge. So this particular flip-flop now toggles from its state zero to one. And you can keep on continuing down the line. In fact, it's a very good idea to keep on checking this out yourselves and figuring out that this really actually gives you the sequence of numbers which stand for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. when you write them out in decimal. So this is exactly how the ripple counter works. At the end of 15 complete cycles, what we will get is 1, 1, 1, 0 changes to 1, 1, 1, 1. When the next falling edge appears, then this one is going to toggle. Of course, this toggling makes this one zero. But that falling edge will make the next JK flip-flop toggle and it will go to zero. That will make this one toggle, it will go to zero, this one toggle, go to zero. So it will start all over again from zero, 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 zero. So this particular four-bit counter, which uses four JK MS flip-flops, will actually count all the way from 0 up to 15 and then go back to 0 and start all over again. As I said, you could add more JK MS flip-flops to the whole, the whole thing and build counters which can count up to the higher and higher numbers. Why is this particular thing called a ripple counter? The answer is in the way in which the carry ripples through the whole circuit. Note that at every stage, you are adding 1 to your number. So you had 0, 0, 0, 1. Adding 1 will actually give you a carry, and the carry goes here. What about this? When you had 0, 0, 1, 1, when you added 1 more to that, that is the next clock edge, right? This one actually toggled, so went to 0. Giving the carry to this one, which actually toggled again, making this 0. And that actually made the zero here toggle to one. So the carry essentially rippled through the whole system. 
In fact, to go from 0, 1, 1, 1 here on the next clock edge to 1, 0, 0, 0 takes quite a lot of ripple in the sense that when this clock edge arrives, that makes this particular JK flip-flops output to toggle. So the 1 goes to 0. And it's actually this toggling which ripples down and makes this one toggle. Then this one toggles. And finally, you'll end up with this one also toggling because this is, of course, the clock for this particular flip-flop. And so now you end up with 1, 0, 0, 0. Now, one important point that you have to realize is this. These toggling's are actually not instantaneous. It takes some time for the signal to propagate all the way to the JKMS flip-flop. A rather short time, but that shorter time can be quite substantial in the world of ultra-fast computers. For example, if I just assume that it takes 10 nanoseconds for the signal to propagate through one flip-flop, here, this Q0 will actually toggle 10 nanoseconds after the clock has actually gone low here. But then, the next one will toggle another 10 nanoseconds later. And this one will toggle another 10 nanoseconds later. So overall, this ripple effect of the carry or the toggling carrying from one end to the other actually slows down this quite a lot. Depending on how many of the bits are toggling, it may take quite a substantially long time. You might say 30 nanoseconds, how big is that? The answer is, it could be quite big. If you are really working with a very, very fast computer, which has a huge clock speed, 30 nanoseconds might even make the difference between the circuit working or not working. So ripple counter is fine for not too fast operations. If you have a small number of bits to handle, the ripple will not be delayed by that much. However, for faster operations, you would actually need other counters. Counters which are called synchronous counters, where all of the inputs can be toggled together, not one after the other. We will see how to build them now. One possible way of getting around this problem of multiple time delays caused by rippling in a ripple counter is by using something which is called a synchronous counter. On your screens right now, you have a circuit of one of the simplest possible synchronous counters which has been made by using positive edge triggered JK flip-flops. We are considering a 4-bit ripple counter here. So we have 4 JK flip-flops and as you can see, each and every one of these have clocks which are tied to a single clock signal. So basically here, the clock signal is being applied to each and every one of the JK flip-flops simultaneously as opposed to the situation in a ripple counter where the clock signal for a particular flip-flop is coming from the output of the previous flip-flop and hence is delayed by the propagation time of the signal inside that flip-flop. Now the way in which this particular thing counts is by ensuring that the toggling of a bit occur or not occur depending on what you need to count the thing properly. In order to understand this, let me just illustrate by showing you the first few numbers in binary. Of course, you all know this, but let me just still remind you of this. Q3, Q2, Q1, Q0, this 4-bit number, this nibble, if you were to start counting in binary, it would go 0, 0, 0, 0. That's, of course, the number 0. Then you have 0, 0, 0, 1. So this bit is toggling. Next you have 0, 0, 1, 0, which means now, if you go from here to here, these two bits have to toggle. 0, 0, 1, 1, then only this one toggles. Next, all three of these bits toggle. 0, 1, 0, 0. So that here, the toggle occurs on all three of these bits. Next, only this bit toggles. 
Then you have 0, 1, 1, 0, where these two toggle, not this one, and so on. Now, there is a very clear pattern here, which you can easily make out. And it's pretty easy to understand why such a pattern would be there. The least significant bit will always toggle. That's a given. But what about the other bits? Note that all the way up to this one, until you reach this, Q2 did not toggle. Q2 only toggled when you were going beyond 0011. Notice that each of the bits to the right of Q2 were one at this case. Indeed, it should be pretty easy to figure out that for the nth bit to toggle this particular bit, what you need is all the bits to the right of it, all the n minus 1 of them, must all be 1. Only if that happens, when you add a 1 to it, that 1 is going to cause a carry in each stage until you get a carry of 1 at this stage and that carry of 1 is going to make this particular bit go from either 0 to 1 or if it was already 1 it would make it go to 0. So in order that the nth bit toggles the boolean variable which describes that is actually the output of all the previous bits and it together so that only when they are all one will you get a toggle. So it should really be qn minus 1, qn minus 2 all the way up to q0. This of course works for n greater than 0. t0 is of course always 1 because the 0th bit will always toggle at every clock edge. Now this means that we will have to set up the jk common input for the nth bit that is for the nth flip-flop so that it's one when all the previous bits all the bits to the right of it are one and zero otherwise now this would of course require you to do an and operation between all of these bits however there's a nice shortcut here which makes life a lot simpler, you can easily see that Tn is actually Qn minus 1 ended with Tn minus 1. So if you take the bit which is controlling whether the n minus 1 flip-flop is going to toggle or not and end it with the output of the n minus 1 flip-flop, that should be the function which decides whether the nth bit is going to toggle or not. And notice that's exactly what has been done in this particular circuit. Take a look, for example, at T3. If this is high, then J3 and K3 are both high. And on the next clock edge, the output Q3 is going to toggle. But how do you get T3? You get T3 by adding together three distinct inputs. One of them, of course, is the count. We have not said something about this so far, but the count really is a control bit. So this is really a controlled synchronous counter with count being the control variable. If count is low, then each one of the JKs in each and every one of these flip-flops will actually get an input of 0 and 0 each. J0, K0 will get 0, 0 because it's directly connected to the count. J1, K1, J2, K2, J3, K3 will get 0, 0 because they're connected to AND gates. One input of which is the count. And therefore, if count is low, the output of the AND gate is always going to be low. For the rest of the discussion, I'm going to assume that count is high so that we can essentially ignore the count as an input to the AND gate. Remember, if one input of an AND gate is high, then the output is dictated entirely by the other inputs. 
So let's forget about the count for the time being simply because we are assuming that count is high. So ignoring the count, what you have here is T3 is actually the result of passing through the AND gate, these two in inputs Q2, the output of the previous flip-flop, and this one, which is actually T2, the bit which controls whether JK or the 2th flip-flop are both high or not. That is, whether the 2th flip-flop is going to toggle or not. Notice here that T2 is a result of actually ending together Q1 and T1. T1 on the other hand is basically the result of ending together Q0 and T0. But T0 is always 1, right? Because the least significant bit always toggles. And so T0 is connected directly to count, which is high now. So Q0 and T0 is obviously the same as Q0. That is why you just need a single input to come in here and one input, of course, from the count. Whereas all the other AND gates here are really three input AND gates. One for Qn minus one, another for Tn minus one, and the third input being the count input, which decides whether this is going to count at all or not. Now it should be very easy for you to figure out that if you first drive the output to, to 0, 0, 0, 0 by making the CLR go low, Therefore, CLR bar goes high and each and every one of these JK flip-flops are cleared. And then set the count high so that the counting starts. At each successive positive clock edge, Q0 is going to toggle. Q1 is going to toggle only if Q0 is high. Q2 is going to toggle only if Q1 and Q0 is high. Q3 is going to toggle only if Q2 and T2 is going high, but that T2, on the other hand, is Q1 and Q0. So, is Q1 and T1, which is actually Q1 and Q0. So, ultimately, each and every bit is going to toggle at just the right time to keep the counting going. If you find this argument difficult to follow, just Start with 0, 0, 0, 0 and keep on following what happens to the output of each JK flip-flop. Basically based on the fact that the, that, that some of these flip-flops are primed to be toggled because they have JK of 1 each and the others will simply not change the output because they have JK of 0 each. Following that, for a few clock cycles, we'll also show you that this counting works perfectly. Notice that the output of each flip-flop which changes or toggles will toggle immediately after the clock pulse hits. Of course, not immediately after. There will be a single propagation time through one JK flip-flop, which will be the delay. But this is not the same situation as in the ripple counter where a significant bit toggling requires all the previous bits to actually change the inputs. And hence, you have propagation delays from each and every one of them. In fact, there are many other kind of counters which you simply don't have the time to go over in this course. There are ring counters which are actually built out of D flip-flops and not JK flip-flops. There are counters which count up to a particular number and then reset back to zero. In fact, there are many more other types. Since we are out of time in this course, this is all we will have time to talk about here. You can find details of other kinds of counters and registers and essentially how they are put together in building a modern digital computer in many textbooks. I would like to recommend Malvino's textbook on digital computer electronics which happens to be a rather accessible and easy to read book on this. Let me sign off at this point. Bye.